Hello everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce Jan Mertens, as I said, the NG Chief Scientific Officer. Jan holds a PhD in environmental engineering from the KUL, but actually he feels very much at home here in Linkebeek because he's also a former colleague. He worked for Laborelec in the years 2008, and he was at that time responsible for the research program on emerging te energy technologies and carbon capture and valorization. So it was already the topics that passionated him. And currently, he contributes to build NG long-term vision on technologies. And it will be the topic of this speech, actually, sustainable emerging technologies to reach carbon neutrality. So let's listen to him very carefully. <laughs> and Ian, the floor is yours. I think I'm Thank you very much for, um, for having me here. Indeed, um, I feel very much at home here. Um, so my name is Jan Mertes. I'm a Chief Science Officer at NG Research, um, where we try to build the long-term vision of NG with respect to, um, to technologies, and I'm also a part-time professor at the University of Ghent. So this is the, the program. So very short, because everybody knows this. What is the two-degree scenario? Even shorter on NG and NG Research. I will concentrate mainly on the three pathways that we think um, should lead us towards this carbon neutrality. To end with the uh, emerging sustainable documents that we publish every year and which you're invited to, uh, to download. It's, it's open access. I will give a little bit of, of uh, what is in this year's uh, version to end with a, with a conclusion. So what does this two degree scenario mean? I think everybody knows that if you want to attain this two degree scenario, we have to get rid of this 36 gigaton which we're emitting today. Um, and we have to be, uh, well, this is a two degree scenario from the IPCC. Well, you've got to be carbon neutral here for all industries somewhere around 2070. But why I like this slide is that with respect to the power generation, which is the orange curve, we have to get rid of this 14 ton that power emits today. Eh? So our carbon, our, our um, fossil fuel uh, generation assets of electricity. We got to be carbon neutral by 2050 and carbon negative afterwards. And this is, of course, something that um, nobody had almost there to say has started looking at. So after 2050, it is expected from the power industry to be carbon negative um, after 2050. So it's true that we should start preparing also this, this part. So carbon neutrality is, is not enough for the, for the power sector. And then you could argue, ah, but who cares? Eh? 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, 3 degrees, doesn't matter that much, does it? Well, in fact, it, it, it does. Because if you have a look at 1.5 degrees, you've got about 3% probability that you will have a, an ice-free Arctic in a, in a particular summer. Um, the average length of a drought is um, two months if you have 1.5 degrees. Now, if you go to two degrees already, it increases to 16% the probability that you'll have an, 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 an ice-free um, uh, Arctic in, in one particular summer, and the average, length go to uh, the average drought goes to about four months. Now, if you go to three degrees, you got about 63% probability, and the average drought length is, is about 10 months. So I mean, three degrees is not, it's not an option, is it? Um, so, so this is a, in, important to say that, because sometimes I hear how oh, 1.5 or 2, if we stray in that area, it's, it's OK. Well, in, in fact, it's, it, it's not. Um, it was already mentioned by, uh, by Olivier Salat this morning. Um, to reach, of course, our, this, uh, this challenge of two degrees, we will need a lot of research and, and innovation. And so this is a slide from the IEA which uh, I like because it shows it really, really well. If you want to be net zero by 2050, well, only the blue part of the technologies are actually technologies that are today mature. All the other technologies, I'm not saying we have to invent them, they exist, but they exist either in pilots, in demonstrations, in prototypes, or even in small laboratories. And if you have a look on particular, oh, thank you. If you have a look on particular um, industries, for example, for the heavy industry and the long distance transport, we hardly got anything mature today. And this is, of course, where you will find your things such as CCUS and hydrogen, which I will talk quite a bit about, um, about later. I forgot to say, um, um, you can always uh, interrupt me, um, or uh, any comments or questions are welcome. I'd be happy not to finish the slides, but have a, have a discussion, and there's no problem. 
But we've also got some, some good news, I think. Eh? Um, if you see that some of these companies are, are taking the lead, eh? it, it's true that today it's mostly the digital companies, but people like Microsoft have announced that they will, don't want to be carbon neutral by 2045, but they will have taken all the CO2 out of the air that they emitted in the past. These are strong statements, and of course they've got, they've got a bit of money, eh? a bit more than, than many uh, other companies. Uh, they, they've put a, a billion, one billion climate innovation fund to, uh, to reach it. So they are looking at carbon negative emission technology seriously, eh? because they have to take the CO2 out of the air, which they emitted over time. Apple, Amazon, all um, are quite large uh, announcement. And the second good news, I think, is that all these current alarming roadmaps, which are, which are true, which are valid, I'm not saying that they're not, 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 not scientifically correct, but we got a chance to prove them wrong because they don't take these emerging breakthrough technologies into account, which is why maybe naively I'm quite hopeful um, that we will actually um, be able to reach this, um, and certainly research and innovation should help in proving them wrong. And I added this slide um, yesterday because you cannot, in these brutal times, you cannot mention uh, or you cannot not mention the, the war. Eh? So what do we think this uh, current uh, brutal times is, 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 <coughs> will, will do to this carbon neutrality and our, and our race um, against it? So when Fatih Birol and the IEA, probably some of you were there in, in Brussels, the day that the war started, he actually said that today can be the day on which the EU starts a historic redesign of its energy priorities and policy, builds its own owned, um, secure, affordable and clean energy future. So there was quite a bit of, even though it was, the war just started, some, some hopes in the, in, the, in the room out there to say that this war could actually speed up um, the energy transition that we, are, that we are going through. At the same time, and I've only put three here because these are three countries very close by, you see announcements like this, uh, Germany may extend coal use um, because they're, they're in trouble with, of course, the, the Russian gas. Also in Belgium, there is a debate about having more um, American shale gas, where we know that there's also some issues with respect to its sustainability. And even in France, eh, last Friday, the government um, uh, is thinking about closing, uh, or not closing, uh, the, the, the power, one, of the, one of its coal-fired power plants. So hopeful, but at the same time, and I think especially in a temporary, um, um, I, don't, I don't know, in fact. Um, so this is, a, I wanted to just mention this uh, very fast. NG and NG Research. NG has announced that, um, that we want to be carbon neutral, and that is not very new because all, con all companies announce that they want to be carbon neutral. By 2045, which is not very, um, very uh, uh, discriminating either, but what they, what they have said or what we have said is that we will be carbon neutral on all three scopes. And that is, um, that is a challenge, I think. Because scope one uh, emissions, those are own emissions, uh, our own emissions at our power plants, for example, uh, at our uh, installations. Scope T, two are hardly zero for NG. I mean, this is an international framework. Eh? This is not uh, something that we invented. Eh? Scope two of a process or of a company are the emissions related to its electricity um, use eh? that, it, that it purchases. And scope three are all the others. So here are all the emissions related to what you buy and what you sell. And what you sell, of course, means that for, for NG, it's electricity and gas. So by announcing that we will be carbon neutral also on our um, scope 3 emissions, basically it means that um, all the gas and electricity that we will sell in 2045 will be carbon neutral. So it will have to be hydrogen, green hydrogen, or it will have to be a biogas, or it will have to be e-methane, but at least it cannot be, a, not, be not carbon neutral. And if you have a look at our emissions today of NG, so scope 1 in our own assets, it's huge, eh? it's 190 million tons. Eh? Um, remember I said we were emitting 36 gigaton, so NG it's about, what is it, 0. 2% or something, I can't remember, um, but it's a, an enormous amount. 28% are emitted in our uh, installations, but this is the 70% which is emitted by our clients because of the use of our products. And that is, of course, where the real challenge is for me. And this is why, again, um, research and innovation is so high um, on our agenda and, and where we're so happy to have this Laborelec amongst other research facilities where we have a great amount of experts helping us to, um, to reach this. In fact, these are some of the pilot plans that we're showing, um, or that I will show you here. Um, I think this one was mentioned already today. Either we've got a storage, a large, where we compare large-scale batteries. Uh, we also do bifacial solar testing. You've seen it, so I won't go through the details. We're not a, a General Electric or a Siemens. Eh? In, in, in usually, we, we're not, well, we're not man technology manufacturers. 
We do have the ambition, though, on everything related to green gases, eh? so to produce hydrogen, for example, on solar panels. Eh? We've got a, a, a pilot test running in, in our lab in Paris. And also biogas, in this case, 2G, second generation biogas. Those are technologies where we want to make also the market and where we also want to produce or manif uh, be a, be a, uh, are interested in, in IP and, and patents, for example. But in many, we partner up with a, with, with a lot of technology manufacturers in the hope, of course, that we, uh, we understand the technology a little bit earlier and better than our colleagues so that we can hand it over to our business units to, of course, win, um, win the bids. The main part, the three pathways towards this carbon neutrality. Uh, so this is a, a, a higher vision of how we think. Um, and this is not only we. Eh? I mean, I think uh, we've discussed also with people like Energyville, even the European Commission. I think there's a, a, an agreement that, that these three pathways are probably make a lot of sense if we want to reach this carbon neutrality. And the order is important. And the first one is the easiest one, or the lowest hanging fruit, if you wish. It's about continuing to increase energy efficiency, because we've been doing this over the last decades. That's not something new. And increase, that is a little bit newer, I guess, is increase our circularity thinking where waste becomes a feedstock. And there, of course, biogas is close to our DNA, is close to our heart. And I think it has a great potential um, to do more uh, of, of biogas especially, I think, if you do it using, uh, using waste. So the easiest, lowest hanging fruit, I think, continue because it is crucial to continue our efforts on energy efficiency and think more circular. And then, of course, the second pathway is the one that everybody's talking about. It's um, to electrify. And I think we agree. Eh? You should try to electrify as much as possible. And not only our electrical cars, but we should try to electrify also the things that are electrifiable in the, in the industry. And this and this electrifying, or at least in the production of, of electricity, we have proven the roadmaps wrong in the past. So this is a slide um, where I've got from the, um, the IEA, publishes each year their World Energy Outlook. The black line is the, what actually happened in the PV installations. And all these lines, starting in 2006, were the actual predictions by the IEA on what would happen on, um, on installed solar capacity. And you see every year they increased, but every year they were still wrong because it was going a lot faster than anybody actually anticipated. And this is, on, this is ongoing, and this is continuing, and it will continue for another while because if you have a look at what's happening for PV panels, and you don't have to look on the details of this, of this graph, but um, the uh, National Renewable Energy Lab publishes every year this slide where they uh, announce um, efficiencies of, of different PV panels. This is not finished, eh? so it has started uh, quite low at around here, 10 percent back in back in the 70s. Eh? Today, commercially, we're somewhere around 23, 23. But of course, um, we have concentrated and other solutions which have different efficiencies. And this is ongoing, particularly because we will start combining technologies. Eh? Things like perovskites combining with silicon will increase the efficiencies, and I think we will soon hit this 30 percent efficiency in the in the future. And we see the same thing, although 10 years later, is actually happening to to batteries, although of course today the, the business case remains difficult for, um, for batteries. This is a slide that I'm showing. So in the second pathway, we will get access to even more and cheaper renewables. And then of course things like flexibility and demand. This is not working again, I don't know. Um, demand, demand side management and, and energy management systems, of course, uh, are, are crucial and we, we, need to, um, we need to provide flexibility and especially try to, of course, um, match the demand with the, um, with the supply. And this is why uh, you will be introduced to things like SMUCH developed here at, uh, at Laberdelec, uh, of course also batteries and, and EMS play a, a great role there. So electricity, the second pathway, crucial and I think where we can, we should electrify far beyond our cars, also in the industry wherever possible. And, and it is why in this emerging technologies document that I talked about, um, and which I, uh, I, uh, I will present a little bit later, actually four out of the six technologies are, uh, are related, that we present four out of the six uh, are related to, um, to electricity and how to get access to enormous amount of renewable electricity at, a, at an affordable cost. Unfortunately, almost, I would dare to say, uh, we will not be able to do everything with electricity. And this is a paper published in Nature at the end of last year, where, they, um, where this is quite, uh, quite well shown. Um, so here on this y-axis, it's a little bit small, but it actually says the marginal abatement cost of a ton of CO2. So how much does it cost to um, 
avoid the emittance of a, of a ton of CO2 is basically what this y-axis says. And here you see dielectric electrification. So if you can do it directly with electricity, which probably it is possible for our passenger cars, for a lot of things in our homes, even for some things in the industry, well, the direct electrification will be most efficient, cheaper, um, and makes most sense. But if you move to things like shipping, planes, high temperature heat in the industry, um, long-term storage of electricity, long-term, long, long, long distance transport um, of energy, well, using electricity, it's, it's, it's either not even possible or it becomes even more expensive than, than, than using what we call molecules. Which is why this third pathway, after you have tried to increase your efficiency, do the same with less. Um, after having electrified, um, we are convinced that we will need um, these, uh, these molecules. And so, of course, um, this is the, um, a slide from the Federal Plan Bureau of Belgium where they show that if Belgium has to be carbon neutral by 2050, don't worry, there are two scenarios. This is a deep electrification scenario, where they electrify everything that is electrifiable. Um, well, what it shows, this graph, is that first of all, in both scenarios, we will need to triple our electricity consumption if we want to be carbon neutral by 2050. So that's a challenge as, as such, I think. The second challenge is it has to, we don't even have to triple it, but it has to be renewable electricity, of course or carbon neutral electricity. Um, and even if you look at the electricity, it's only the blue part that will actually be used as electricity as electrons. The green part, there we will, um, ah, thank you. We will need to convert um, the electricity into X, into a molecule, to be able to do what we want to do, high temperature heat, long distance transport, long term storage, aviation, and, and things like that. We will need to convert these electrons into a, a molecule to be able to do um, what, we, um, what we can do. Almost pitiful enough because you throw away a lot of good electricity, of course. So this need for molecules, and that's why it's very high on our research agenda as well. Eh? And of course, if you talk about molecules, the first obvious molecule that everybody is talking about today is, um, is hydrogen. And so hydrogen is, um, <laughs> so maybe it's just me being too impatient. Oh, very good. So hydrogen is, um, and it has different colors, eh? and this is a nice slide where you go green hydrogen from renewable electricity, gray hydrogen, if you capture the CO2, we call it blue hydrogen. You can even do turquoise hydrogen, where you do a natural gas pyrolysis and you end up with a solid carbon. So there are different ways to get access to what we call low carbon um, um, hydrogen, and we're investigating quite a lot of them, of course, also in our research facilities. There's one challenge with hydrogen that it has a very, very low energy density and it's very, very difficult to, uh, to store for a long time or to transport. And this is what I tried to depict in this, in this slide, which we published together with Energyville actually uh, already two years ago now, um, in a little bit of controversial title, why the carbon neutral transition will imply the use of a lot of carbon. If you want to transport 10 kilowatt hour of energy, so a certain amount of energy, well, we can actually do that with one liter of diesel of petrol or kerosene or some high uh, value uh, hydrocarbon. You can do it with 1.7 liters of LNG, eh, liquefied natural gas, at minus 160 degrees. And we know how to do this quite efficiently, this production of this LNG. Now, if you go to, um, well, first of all, batteries, you see you need about 27 times the same volume to produce the same amount of energy. So any uh, electrical planes flying on batteries, I, I don't think we will see it any long distance, at least. Um, and a lot of people from flying electrical planes will not see that anytime soon. But even hydrogen, eh? even hydrogen, if you compress it to 350 bars, you need to transport 13 times the same volume. If you compress it even further, it's still seven times. So we can make it liquid. Making it liquid means going down to minus 250 degrees. And by doing so with the technologies that we have today, although we're working on it to improve it, we consume about 35 or even more percent of the energy in our hydrogen to actually make it liquid. And even then we need to transport four times more. So probably, if you need to uh, transport and store, transport over longer distances or store over longer periods, it probably makes more sense to look into other molecules as well, things as um, methane, of course, eh, a gas, but also why not ammonia, methanol, and this is, of course, why, um, why we're working not only on hydrogen, because hydrogen, of course, it's still preferred if you can actually get access to it, for example, in pipelines or, or it's close, produced close by, it's probably a good solution. 
But if you need to do things at another location where it is produced, which we may have to do, because in the Federal Plan Bureau, of course, this tripling of electricity, well, they said quite a bit will have to be imported. Eh? Um, and that, of course, we cannot do as electricity with batteries, but even hydrogen there is not the preferred molecule. And this is why uh, this uh, controversial hydrogen ladder, I almost dare to say, uh, makes, uh, makes quite a bit of, of, of sense. Eh? So everybody knows this about the efficiency of your refrigerator and freezer. Eh? So if you can do things with electricity, things like two and three wheelers, um, or even uh, hydrogen fuel cell cars, avi light aviation, regional trucks, probably if you can do the electricity, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's much more efficient and it's not very efficient to do these things with hydrogen. Let's keep our hydrogen and the other great molecules to do things which we cannot do with electricity because that's where they are more efficient and, and, not, uh, and, and not for things which we can do with electricity. So I think we're convinced now that we will still need these molecules for this third pathway. Um, and so uh, this is what we should stop doing, is taking it out of the ground, burning it to produce power and heat. And of course, this is uh, the, the, the guy we don't want. So we've, we, but we still need this one. We still need our natural gas in this case, or our methanol, or ammonia, or whatever. So we need to make it. Um, so we need to make it. And that is, of course, we can do um, using um, renewable electricity. We need a lot of renewable electricity, or renewable energy at least, to actually split, in many cases, our water into hydrogen and oxygen. Or there are people in the room, uh, uh, at from Vito, for example, where they try to do it immediately, eh, to do co-electrolysis with water and CO2 to split the hydrogen, to split the water into hydrogen and oxygen, make it react with CO2 to produce the molecule which we need. And at least in this case, if the CO2 is taken from the atmosphere, or if it's biogenic, for example, it allows us to become carbon neutral, also for these sectors where electricity cannot do the job. And probably the day after tomorrow, as I said, especially the power industry has to be carbon negative. Part of this CO2 we will have to, um, we'll have to store away as well, which is depicted here using a CCS, of course. So one of those projects, we've got a lot of them, but one of the projects is the power to methanol uh, uh, project in, um, in Antwerp, eh, where, of course, we will capture the CO2. In this case, it's not yet, I dare to say, from the, uh, from the uh, ambient air, it's from an industry where we have hydrogen partly made with renewables, partly as a, as a waste stream, to produce our methanol, which we can use either as a fuel, but also as a chemical feedstock, because it's a perfect chemical feedstock for the, the chemical industry in, in nearby. This is um, what it looks like, and these are the, the different partners. Probably some of you are, uh, are, are amongst us here today. And this is a paper published by a colleague from, from Ghent, which I like because I like the word play. Eh? We should move from a fossil chemistry towards using huge amounts of abundant, uh, huge amounts of uh, renewable electricity to go to this e-chemistry eh, where we still need all these products. Eh, we need, still need plastic, solvents, detergent, but actually made from CO2, water, and maybe some other um, uh, resources and a lot of, a lot of uh, electrification, a lot of electricity. So moving from fossil chemistry to this um, e-chemistry is, is, is what I think could, um, Antwerp could take a, a leading role in there. And, um, <clears throat> and this, is, this is why e-fuels, for example, are so high on our agenda. It used to be something, when I was still at Labradelec, it used to be something for the, 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 the nerds uh, here, um, the, the, the research nerds. It used to be something really exciting them. Today, it's also exciting our, our business units, which is great news, because they are actually building these things um, in, um, in, in real. So. Voila. Now I'll come to this um, emerging sustainable technologies document that we um, we publish every year, and only three years ago, for the first time, we decided to publish also at, uh, externally, uh, because we actually, uh, it's, it's really a, a call for collaboration. It's really sharing our view on what we think are emerging sustainable technologies, and not all of them are in our um, strategy. Eh? Uh, some of them are not in our strategy, but we think these are technologies that could possibly make the difference. And so how do we select them? That is also always, and I wanted to add this slide, don't, don't read it. Uh, but uh, how do we select it? It's, uh, we've tried different things. If you can, you can do it more quantitatively. Eh? You can look for where did you find the most patents, which is word is most published. All of these quantitative measures, in fact, if you do them and we try them, you only end up with digital technologies <laughs> because so many people are working on digital technologies that if you do, if you look, try to do these quantitative measures, you will never uh, detect or identify um, any other um, 
uh, other energy technologies apart from the digital ones. Which is why we, and, and, and I'm sure you're convinced after having a tour here, we rely on our experts who combine this industrial expertise with their academic and scientific background. Eh? Many of them have passed first their lives in research centers or, 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 uh, or universities, are today also uh, partly working in, in, the, in the industry. So, so we really rely on, on their expertise, which is why we think our document is a little bit, let's call it different, I don't dare to say better, uh, than, than what these consultants uh, just at the World Economic Forum or the Accenture or the other people in the world publish. And this year, we've made a part two which is, what about the technologies we reported on in previous editions? So how wrong were we uh, when we presented five years ago a technology and what did happen to that technology? Did it actually really break through or were we completely wrong? And it turns out we were sometimes wrong and sometimes um, right. Um, voilà. So you can find these six technologies in the document of this year. There is no time to produce all, to, to, uh, to explain all six of them. I will focus very fast on one of them, metal fuse, since I think most of the others um, you can either see here today or you can also read um, um, if you're interested uh, later. So metal fuse, what's this concept of metal fuse? Again, it's the idea of we need, a, a, at least for us, we see it as a way to store or to transport renewable energy over long time periods or over long distances. So basically what you do is you have, for example, an iron powder, very, very fine. A metal powder, if it's very fine, it's actually very explosive. Eh? So you make it react with oxygen, you burn it, so you get your iron oxide, which then you move to places where you have a lot and cheap renewable electricity. You reduce it from your iron oxide, your rust, you reduce it back to your iron, and of course then uh, using hydrogen, and then of course it allows you to transport or to store this amount of renewable electricity or energy over long distances or long time periods. This is the concept behind it. And this could, uh, Possibly done just in, in traditional boilers, eh? it's like burning coal. Eh? If you burn coal, you also make it very fine powder first. Well, here you've got your fine iron, you burn it, you get your iron oxide, you probably need to move it to places where you have cheap electricity and then um, transport it back. What's the challenge? Um, well, there are many challenges um, on it today, especially this reduction phase is still very, very low TRL. And another challenge which we found out is that that if you burn things, the, these powders, well, if, you, if the temperature is too high, they start agglomerating, um, or, or, or if it's too high, actually, or if there's too much uh, different uh, circumstances, either they become too large and they're no longer active, or they become too small and you actually lose them with your flue gas. So these are one of the challenges that are still out there today and where quite a bit of people are working on it. So these are the people working, of course, because you've got a lot of people thinking, oh, this is great for my selling my metal. Quite a lot of knowledge institutes and even Shell having it high on their agenda. And, uh, and reduction step, you see, it's only TRL3. So there's a lot of work to be done how we can reduce this rust back with, uh, with, uh, with hydrogen back to, uh, back to iron. What about the technology? So that gives us a, lot of, a bit of time to, have, to take some questions and, and discussions. What are technologies we reported on before? Um, so what we did is we tried to, again, eh, more quant qualitatively than quantitatively, we worked with errors. Eh? So a straight arrow up, arrow up, was well, something that is work in process. It's moving, but very, very slowly. Or actually, this has gone from, from, um, from when we uh, detected it. One thing which we detected about three years ago, or which we reported on three years ago, because it exists longer, of course, eh? um, it's about three years ago. What happened between then and now? Well, clearly, direct air capture is, is booming today. And eh? we've got the first project here, Climeworks, in Switzerland, where they're actually capturing the CO2 with these huge ventilators and storing it away in a basalt formation. So they're doing CCS, so DAC CCS, which is one of the carbon negative technologies that we have available um, today. Of course, still too expensive, but at least technology-wise, it, it is being demonstrated. And here it is to do, to do CCS with, but of course, if we have the CO2, we could probably also do um, smart things with it, use it as a research, which is, uh, again, we, pub we published on this or we detected this a few years ago, this is even longer ago, to have this ambient CO2, uh, capture CO2 to these e-fuels using, using hydrogen. Clearly, this is also a technology that we identified as booming. Some other things, for example, a few years ago, there was a lot of fuss about storing electricity inside turbine towers. Well, today, this is hardly still uh, talked about. Or the same for electricity storage in, 
Um, well, in the sea it depends what you, but at least this technology we don't we, we don't see anymore. Last, enabling technologies. Um, here, this was two years or three years ago. We really identified sustainable catalysts as energy transition enablers as one of the um, emerging technologies, but at the same time challenges. Um, so we, if you see what we look today eh, with our um, electricity, our PV panels, there's a lot of materials in there. If you look at uh, uh, wind, a lot of materials. If you look at hydrogen, even in the, the, the fuel cells uh, or in the, um, the electrolyzers, they do contain um, the, the, these catalysts. So it is crucial that we get access to them in a sustainable way and that we don't do what, what we've, we've done in the past. Eh? So this is a, a quite, quite nice graph which I, which I took from, from Michael Weber when, when he was uh, with us at, at, at Engie. If you see a look at the past, actually, um, well, here, wood was dominant. Luckily, luckily, coal came because it saved the forests. And so here, between 1880 and 1940, it was coal dominant. And here, it's oil dominant. And probably, we may have to adapt this, I'm not sure, but natural gas could be dominant in the, in, in the, in, in the next decade. So actually, coal saved the, um, um, the, the forest. If you have a look here at what happened between 1850 in the US, and I think it's 19... Um, 20, when, uh, when, the, when the coal came in, you see that the amount of forest decreased from 1820 to 138 of acres. The same thing happened with oil saving the whales. Eh? Back in the 18, mid-1850s, there was a lot of whale oil, for um, not only for lighting, but for things like uh, soap. If you then oil came in, and it was uh, in a few decades, completely, the, it, it, it washed away the, uh, the, the, the whale oil and it, it saved the whales. So we should be careful that with our focus on CO2 and global warming, which is crucial, of course, I'm not saying the opposite, but we need to get access to these enormous amount of critical materials to avoid things like um, saying in 50 years, how uh, maybe, I don't know, what saved the, the critical raw materials. This is the IEA again last year published, just to give you an idea of an electrical car, it needs about six times the amount of, um, of these critical minerals than a conventional car, but also in the power generation, eh, our wind, and our PV needs a lot more of these materials, some of them critical, some of them are not, um, but at least more um, than our coal and our, and, our, and our natural gas. And so we need to be sh sure that we get access into a sustainable way. First of all, we need to have a lot of them. And there you see the IAA things that, for example, things like cobalt, between our ambitions, the red degree, the red line is actually the two degree scenario, is what we need the amount of cobalt to reach our two degree scenario. And what will be available, it is the dark blue and the light blue, well, there is a gap between what will be available and what we will need to meet our ambitions. And of course, there are things like recycling and, and um, uh, substitutivity. Eh? Can we substitute cobalt for another more earth abundant metal? We'll have to part, be part of the solution. Because opening more mines just takes longer and longer. This is a paper from, um, from a friend of mine, which he published la last year. Um, you see a nickel mine back in the 60s, it took around 15 years to open it, today it's almost double. So relying on new opening of new mines is, is, is not the, it's part of the solution, but it's certainly not the, 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 the only solution. And things like recycling and substitivity make a, make a lot of sense. So it's about having enough, but also probably about doing it cleaner than we do today. Eh? Um, I like this, um, this picture because it just shows you the amount of energy and water and chemicals that are being used at these, at these mines. Uh, this machine accidentally took up a, a bulldozer. Um, so you can see the enormous amount of, of, of energy and, and damage that this is actually also doing to the, to, the, um, to the environment. So it's about not having enough, probably doing it a lot cleaner than we do today. And the third one, there are also some social and ethical issues, especially I think the best example is, is in Congo, where we know that there are some things like child labors for cobalt is, a, is, a, is, a, is an issue. And we also need to take it into account. Voila. I will stop here. Only just a few more slides to say that I think I had a boss a few years ago and I wanted to publish a, a paper called The Future is the End, with the end uh, A and D. But I was not allowed because he said, ah, but this, it will give our top management the idea that we're not focusing and we need to focus, you know. But I, 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 I still think there is a lot of truth, and I'll, uh, I'll still publish it someday. Um, so um, the, I like this vision from, from ATIP, um, where, where they clearly say that this, this future is the end. So there will be a variety of, of generation sources. Eh? It will not be only PV, it will not be only wind. We'll probably have some gas turbines. 
We may even have a nuclear power plant. Um, so it's a combination of all of these generation technologies and, and also the customer in 2050 will be engaged and will be part of, of, of the story. Yeah? So peer-to-peer, vehicle-to-grid, large-scale, small-scale, all of these um, positive houses, rest communities will be part of the, of the future. And of course, multiple forms of, of storage, which I've said before. So the future is the, the end, and maybe one of these six technologies will also be part of the future. And so you're welcome to download it if you're interested and have a look at it um, when you're uh, at home. So I will stop here, and if time allows, I'm happy to take some remarks or suggestions or questions. <laughs> Thank you.